So welcome everybody. Uh, uh, so we are very pleased to have Surjit Rajendran from the Johns Hopkins University, uh, who's going to tell us about new experimental searches for dark matter. So uh, I would encourage that if you have any questions, if you raise your hand, then I can unmute you and then you can ask your question. I think that will work best uh, if that is okay with you, Surjit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to give these uh, talks to you guys. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so my plan, I, I guess I have three lectures and uh, the plan is for the first couple of them, that is today and tomorrow, I'll talk about some new directions in the search for dark matter specifically. And on Friday, I will talk about some new ways to find gravitational waves. So that's kind of what I have uh, planned and we'll see how far I get along. Uh, I do have some, uh, I think reasonably nice notes for the dark matter section, which I will uh, send to the, to the uh, secretary and they'll probably share it with you. Uh, for, the, for the gravitational wave stuff, I've not written anything, but uh, you know, uh, the papers are even fairly new. So we'll see how, how well we do. All right, um, dark matter. Why is dark matter interesting? Because we know the dark matter is a new particle, right? Uh, the observations, the bullet cluster conclusively show that there's a new particle in the world. And it is in fact, the most definitive evidence that we actually have of the existence of new physics, other than the fact that there is more matter than antimatter in the universe, stuff like that. So because there is this new particle, it is very reasonable to think that this new particle has non-gravitational interactions because pretty much every particle we know about other than the graviton has non-gravitational interactions. So if it has these non-gravitational interactions, it's very, very important to find it because by finding it, not only do you learn about a new sector in physics, wherever the dark matter is coming from, you kind of understand perhaps uh, what may have produced the dark matter. It may give you insight into early universe cosmology that sort of thing, right? So it's just a new tool for us to understand the fundamental laws of nature. And that's why it's very important to try to find these non-gravitational interactions. But the key question is how do you detect them, right? Uh, this particle is there. It probably has these non-gravitational interactions. How do we find them? The challenge in detecting dark matter is the fact that uh, the reason why we call the dark matter dark is because its effects on us are very weak. And because of these effects are weak, we probably need very high precision techniques to be able to find these very weak effects. And that's kind of where the story gets very interesting because if you look at what's happened in the world of technology in the last two decades or so, there have been very impressive developments in the field of what is called precision instrumentation, which is our ability to measure uh, small numbers very accurately. So for example, today, one can measure magnetic fields that are smaller than a femtotesla, okay? Uh, with what are called squid and atomic magnetometers. Uh, one can actually measure accelerations that are less than 10 to the minus 13 times the acceleration of gravity. And that is through atom and optical interferometers. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you ask any of the guys who work in this field, uh, they will not say that these numbers are final. They, in fact, uh, ever since my actual involvement in this field, I've in fact witnessed them make these numbers better uh, by an order of magnitude or two every few years. So in fact, this number of accelerometers being 10 to the minus 13 little g is no longer correct. The correct number today is 10 to the minus 15 little g. Okay, so, and that just happened in the last two years or so. So uh, it is in fact the case that because of these rapid technological advancements, uh, you can imagine how can we actually use these new techniques to detect new physics specifically the physics of dark matter and maybe gravitational waves as well. So uh, before we talk about uh, what kinds of uh, dark matter we can find, things like this, let's ask an observational question, right? Uh, we know there is this dark matter out there. What do we know about its mass? Okay, a very simple question. How well have we as theorists learned to constrain the mass of dark matter? So naively, we know the dark, the mass of dark matter has to be larger than 10 to the minus 43 GeV because that is a Hubble scale. So if you have a particle in the universe, its mass better be larger than the Hubble scale. Otherwise it wouldn't count as a particle. So without even doing anything, you know it's bigger than 10 to the minus 43 GeV. The upper end of 10 to the 48 GeV actually comes from the fact that if the dark matter is heavier than this. It would cause a lot of bending of light, right? So uh, imagine you have a very, very heavy dark matter object light from distant planets or stars would come to us and they get bent 
uh, due to gravitational lensing. And the absence of gravitational lensing in the Kepler experiment, for example, tells us the mass has to be less than 10 to the 48 GeV or 10 to the 24 grams. It's about an Earth mass, something like that. But we can do a little bit better than this. We can make use of the fact that we know that the dark matter is actually in the galaxy. And the fact that the dark matter is in the galaxy it turns out it puts two non-trivial limits on its mass, much better than 10 to the minus 43 GeV, okay? So for example, if the dark matter was a fermion, as the mass of the dark matter goes down, its number density will go up because we know the amount of energy density there is. Now for a fermion, as a number density goes up, eventually you will run into Fermi degeneracy, right? You can't pack more than one fermion in the same mode. So simply the fact that the dark matter fits inside the galaxy or really a dwarf galaxy, that turns out to put a limit on the mass of a fermion saying the fermion mass has to be larger than let's say 10 to 100 electron volts, something of that order. Okay, so for a fermion, if that's it, all of the dark matter has to be above this number. Of course, the dark matter is bosonic, if it's a boson, that particular limit does not actually apply. But then there's another limit that shows up, which is the fact that uh, even though you can pack lots of bosons in the same mode, uh, there's a de Broglie wavelength of the boson. So as the mass of the dark matter goes down, its de Broglie wavelength will get larger and larger and larger. And eventually the de Broglie wavelength would, could become larger than the size of the galaxy itself. If that is the case, the dark matter won't fit inside the galaxy. And that puts a limit of around 10 to the minus 22 electron volts on the mass of the, low, of the lightest boson that could be all of the dark matter. So that's pretty much what we observationally know, right? There's an enormous range of masses of the dark matter could be, something like 60 to 70 orders of magnitude uh, between what is observationally known. Anything beyond this is a theory of prejudice. We don't actually know what it actually is. Now, there's one guess what the, perhaps what the dark matter could be, which is that uh, we know the standard model has a scale, the weak scale of around 100 GeV or so. And if that is the case, you know, uh, it is not unreasonable to think that uh, maybe the dark matter is tied to that weak scale. And that gives rise to this possibility of what is called weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs, okay? And uh, people have been searching for these WIMP dark matter for like 30, 40 years now. They haven't found it yet. And uh, pretty soon, these things will hit something called a solar neutrino floor. We will talk about this later on in this talk. Uh, but that's kind of where that particular program is. But that's just like one possibility, right? There's an enormous range of masses living out there. Uh, beyond that, there are a variety of other dark matter candidates that one could think about. Uh, axions, massive vector bosons. I mean, I call these things dark blobs, all kinds of things. Uh, my point of view on this has been the following, right? Is that if you look at it, there's an enormous range of possibilities of where the dark matter could actually be. And uh, what is true is the following, right? If any experiment in the world let's say discover dark matter anywhere in this parameter space, the next day on the archive, there will be a hundred different theorists writing papers saying that's exactly the dark matter candidate that they knew had to exist, right? It's incredibly easy to write down dark matter models. It's not that hard to do. So the real question scientifically is that given this is enormous 60 orders of magnitude in parameter space, how do we scientifically probe large chunks of it? That is the actual question. Okay, so uh, that is what this talk is based upon. It is this question of how do we systematically probe this enormous range of possibilities? Any questions about this? Right, I guess. Yeah, can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what is this dark blob? It's a black hole or what? Oh yeah, sorry. That is just a, a large composite state of dark matter. So I would consider myself a dark blob, right? Like it's just a statement that, so uh, if you look at 10 to the 48 GeV, you sort of realize it's well above the Planck scale. So that can't really be a fundamental particle. What it can be is a composite system. And I sort of call them blobs. I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll actually talk about this more in the, in the lecture tomorrow uh, where we have a systematic way of probing that as well. Good, thanks. All right, so in today's discussion, these are the topics that we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk about how do we systematically probe what is called ultralight dark matter, which is uh, dark matter with a mass above 10 to the minus 22 electron volts to about say 10 to the minus five EV or so, okay? 
Uh, and then we're going to talk about a way to detect uh, the direction of dark matter. So this is going to be helpful in going past this neutrino floor that we have talked about for uh, uh, dark matter, uh, for WIMP dark matter. And then I'll talk about another topic called magnetic bubble chambers, which is sort of a newer technological enterprise that I've been engaged in. All right, so let's talk about uh, ultralight dark matter, dark bosons. Uh, you know, what does that actually mean? What does it look like? So before we talk about dark boson specifically, let's talk about a boson we understand very well, which is the photon, right? So here are photons being produced from a laser. And one can think about those photons, of course, as individual particles streaming out, that's perfectly fine. But another equally good way of talking about these photons is that we can say there's an electromagnetic wave, a classical electromagnetic wave being produced by this laser. And I can describe that classical electromagnetic wave by some E naught cosine omega T minus omega X, where E naught is the amplitude of the wave and that corresponds to some energy density that is living in this particular wave. And one way to detect this photon, of course, is by measuring the time bearing electromagnetic field associated with this photon. So this is of course practically not how you detect a photon, but this is how you, you detect a radio wave. You would say there is a time bearing electromagnetic field and I'm gonna measure that time bearing electromagnetic field to detect this radio wave or photon or whatever. So how do these dark bosons show up? How, how are they the dark matter? Well, uh, just like how the photon has a classical field associated with it, uh, you know, the dark matter boson will also have a classical field associated with it or quantum field or whatever. And uh, we would simply say that, uh, you know, that field looks like some amplitude A naught times cosine MT. Okay, so there is one key difference between the photon and the dark boson field. The photon is massless, so of course its energy and momentum are tied to each other, uh, while for the case of the dark matter, the velocity could be zero. Okay, so there isn't a momentum component here, it's just some A naught cosine mt, it's just oscillating back and forth at a frequency equal to its energy, which when the velocity is zero, is just a rest mass m. Uh, and because the amplitude is non-zero, there will uh, be some energy density associated with it, and that could be the dark matter. So what one can verify is that in the very early universe, right, when the whoever knows where, how the universe was produced, uh, there is no particular reason to think that this amplitude should be zero. So there will be some initial value for this field, and one can actually show that this initial value of the field will give rise to some energy density, and, and that energy density behaves exactly like dark matter. And by behaving exactly like dark matter, I basically mean that it redshifts just like dark matter. So the very early universe, that's kind of how we think about these things. We would simply say the dark matter is homogeneous. It has a one value around the entire universe and it's oscillating back and forth at a frequency equal to its mass. So it looks like someone has a question. Yeah, let me read it out for you. Uh, yeah. Chen Bai is asking a naive question. What makes us believe that dark matter is a kind of particle rather than some kind of modified gravity? What evidences ah. are there that dark matter is more like a particle? Good. So this is the question that we actually, uh, I briefly alluded to at the very beginning. So, so that is this thing called the bullet cluster. So here's an image. Okay. So what this actually shows are two clusters of galaxies that are merging. Okay. And you got to think about what that means. Uh, so I'll tell you what the picture shows. So, so these are two galaxy clusters that are merged. And here is where the stars are. Okay. And here is where the gas is. What is this showing, right? So when two clusters of galaxies go through each other, the stars are occupy a very small volume, small fraction of the volume of the galaxy. So the stars don't hit each other. They just kind of go through each other. Most of the mass in the galaxy is actually in gas, like hydrogen gas, things of that kind. So the gas, of course, is distributed everywhere. So as it goes through, it hits each other and gets very hot. So what we see in an X-ray telescope is that this is a location of the gas, which is most of the visible baryonic mass of the cluster, okay? The stars are only about 1% or so of the overall thing. So the gas is somewhere here, okay? That is a red thing that we see in the X-rays. What you can now do is you can ask, where is the gravity of the system showing up? And I can do that by gravitational lensing. So when I do gravitational lensing, I look at where the actual mass is. What we find is that in gravitational lensing, the mass is somewhere here. It tracks the location of the stars, okay? So the lensing pictures show that the gravitating mass is here. 
while the, op the X-ray telescope picture shows that the baryonic mass is somewhere here. So it's pretty funny, right? In some sense, we learned that the stars, which are a small fraction of the actual mass of the dark ma uh, uh, mass of the galaxy, is where all the gravity actually looks like it's coming from. What that tells you, of course, is that the gravitating mass is not in the gas. It is actually over here. And we know that the stars are a small fraction of the mass of the galaxy anyway. So the mass is actually coming from this side, which therefore must be a new particle that went through in this collision, as opposed to getting stuck somewhere in the middle. So I hope that answers the question. There are also more questions. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, Mozambique is asking, does dark matter interact with radiation? Dark matter could interact with radiation, but currently, I mean, it's theoretically possible, but we have no, we have sort of limits on that. Uh, if the dark matter did interact with radiation, for example, it would have changed the cosmic microwave background in various ways. So the fact that we haven't seen those things uh, gives limits on that kind of interaction, but we have no evidence that there is such an interaction. Are there more questions or? No, uh, that's it in the chat box. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so we're back here where we basically say, yes, this is the uh, energy density in the field, right? So in the early universe, someone created this dark matter for us and is behaving that way. Of course, we don't live in the early universe, we live today. And today, the dark matter is not uh, you know, uniformly present everywhere, right? It's not, it's not gonna be a spatially uniform oscillating field in the entire uh, galaxy. Uh, in fact, in the galaxy, the dark matter has fallen in, all kinds of violent things have happened to it over the last 10 billion years or so. So how do we think about the dark matter field today, in the galaxy? Well, uh, I would say the dark matter field is probably very random, right? All kinds of things have happened to it since the beginning of time. Even though it's a random field, I can think of, I can still ask the question about a correlation length for the field which basically says, given that the dark matter has one value here, how far, how long do I have to go before the value of the dark matter field changes by order one, okay? So if you ask that question in Fourier space for a second, you immediately realize that the correlation length of the field should be one over MV, one over the de Broglie wavelength, because of course, anytime the field is spatially varying, that would correspond to momentum. All right, there'll be a cosine kx in this case, and k of course is the momentum of the dark matter. And that basically says that the correlation length is one over mv, because that is the momentum, the de Broglie wavelength of the field. Now in an experiment, I'm not interested just in the correlation length, I'm interested in what's called the coherence time, which is essentially how much time do I have to sit and measure this field? So, so we are basically saying that, oh, the correlation length of this field is one over mv, v being the velocity of dark matter, and then we're asking, how long do I take to go through this correlation length? My relative velocity is also V, which therefore says that the coherence time, the time I have to transit a distance that is order one over MV is one over MV squared, okay? So the coherence time is one over MV squared. Another way to think about this is to say that, look, the dark matter has a mass M and has a kinetic energy, one half MV squared. And V of course is randomly varying from you know, different parts of the galaxy, different parts of the galaxy. So the, the rough coherence time before some phase changes by order one is going to be mv squared, one over mv squared. That's how you get the coherence time. And this is where the story gets very interesting, which is that uh, even though many of these particles, you know, axions, things of that kind, they come from very high energy physics, right? So some symmetry broken in the UV and there's some Goldstone boson, blah, blah, blah. But because these are Goldstone bosons, their mass can be very low. So in principle, their mass could be as small as something like a megahertz or something like that, which is some, something like 10 to the minus nine electron volts. Why is that number interesting? The reason why that number is interesting is that let's say this mass was a megahertz, just as an example, right? Uh, the velocity of the dark matter in the galaxy is about 10 to the negative three, which means that the coherence time, the amount of time I have to measure this particular signal is one second. And that's why this is interesting is because us as human beings, one second is a nice time scale for an experiment. I can build something and measure something for a second before moving on and doing something else, right? That number could have been anything. That number could have been 10 to the minus 24 seconds. If it had been 10 to the minus 24 seconds, it's very hard for us to build an instrument as human beings 
to go and measure something, right? But it just happens to be the case, it's one second, which gives us the opportunity that we can construct devices that are able to sit there for a second and do some measurement. Also the frequency at which things are oscillating is like a megahertz, right? Our radio is generally operated at megahertz. So we as human beings have built a lot of technology to be able to measure signals of the, these kinds of characteristics. That's kind of what makes this program exciting experimentally, that we are able to build instruments, even though naively these numbers could have been anywhere. So that is the goal of this whole story, which is that we are going to detect the effects of this oscillating dark matter field and thus find it. Just like how I'm going to detect a radio, right? A radio wave is detected by looking at the time bearing electromagnetic field associated with the radio wave. I'm going to similarly detect the time bearing classical field associated with the axion and use that to detect the axion itself or any other kind of light dark matter. There's a natural possibility of a resonance in the story which is a statement that the coherence time, right? It's one over mv squared. Well, the frequency is of course m. And since v is about 10 to the minus three, uh, I have 10 to the six oscillations of the field before the phase of the field will change completely differently. So I can have a resonator, okay? That I'm oscillate, that I'm sitting there and measuring with a quality factor of about 10 to the six to sit and listen to this dark matter signal. That's the plot of the story. Any questions about this? Okay. So what particular kinds of dark matter are interesting to us? You know, uh, there could be a lot of different kinds. So we'll do two things. First, I'll start by just talking about it from a theoretical point of view, and then we'll take a very experimental point of view. So we're talking about particles with a very, very low mass, right? So uh, a reasonable thing to say is that, look, if I have a bosonic field that is 10 to the minus 22 electron volts in mass, and I want this thing to couple to standard model particles, surely there'll be radiative corrections and things of this kind, which will make it much heavier than the 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. So what kinds of particles can we reasonably think about? Okay. So if you want the theory to be natural, there are only a small number of ways in which a boson can be that light and still interact with a standard model and be uh, sort of reasonable from technical naturalist point of view. And that is if there is some symmetry that protects what the mass of the particle. And once you utter the word symmetry, there are only a small number of ways in which symmetry would allow us to interact with these, with these new particles. So if you're a boson, let's say you're a spin zero boson, and these are examples like axions and things of this kind, there are only about four possible interactions I can write down allowing a boson to interact with standard model and still be technically natural, okay? So uh, these are basically the operators. Uh, let's call this A an axion, just the heck of it. Uh, that can couple electromagnetism to the coupling FF dual. It can couple to QCD to the coupling GG dual. Uh, the field can couple to spins of, neutral, of nuclei or electrons to the operator d mu a n bar gamma mu gamma 5 n, okay, like an axial coupling. And uh, finally, it can couple to the Higgs boson to this coupling G phi Higgs squared, uh, which is the Higgs portal or the relaxion coupling or whatever, right? So these are only the, basically the four leading order interactions that I can write down with the boson and the standard model uh, in a way that the interaction is technically natural. That's it, four possible couplings. The other possibility is spin one. And if something is spin one, I could, uh, if I have to interact with the standard model, I better write down some anomaly free interaction. And there are essentially three possible couplings. Okay. Uh, one is that the dark matter field, I've, I, I represent that by F prime, it's gauge field strength, F prime. Standard model particles may have a dipole moment under this new interaction, right? The neutron has a dipole moment under electromagnetism. Similarly, the neutron or the electron or whatever could have a dipole moment under this new gauge interaction F prime, okay? So A prime is the gauge field and F prime is the field strength. Uh, it can also interact with electromagnetism through, through kinetic mixing, okay? So this, this F is electromagnetism, this F prime is a new gauge interaction, and there is some epsilon uh, kinetic mixing between these two guys. And the last possibility is that standard model particles are directly charged under uh, this new gauge interaction. And the canonical example of that is something called the B minus L interaction, okay? There's some baryon minus lepton number interaction uh, that you can write down, which would allow us to couple to this new sector. So these are the seven possible operators you can write down, okay? That's it. 
And how do we find these things? Well, what we're going to do is uh, if any of these particles happen to be the dark matter, okay, all I'm going to do is take the classical field that corresponds to the dark matter energy density, some A naught cosine MT or something, and stick that into these operators here. That's it. I take A equal to A naught cosine MT, plug it in over here. And what am I going to get? I'm going to immediately see that these operators, okay, get coefficients that become time dependent, right? So, the, the, so these are standard model fields, just leave them as they are. Just substitute for the value of the dark matter here. I'm going to get A naught cosine MT sitting in front of all of these guys. And I can simply ask, what is the effect of an A naught cosine MT sitting in front of one of these guys and look for the physics associated with that. And what's interesting is that uh, this physics is oscillating. It moves back and forth at a frequency equal to the mass of the dark matter, which we don't of course know. It could be 10 to the minus seven Hertz or 10 to the minus 22 electron volts to 10 gigahertz, whatever it is. Some large range of, 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 of frequencies could be living in there. Uh, so I could go ahead and measure some specific signal oscillating at that particular frequency, okay? And this is experimentally very important because generically, if you turn on an experiment, you will see all kinds of signals, right? There'll be some signals at 60 Hertz coming from some uh, 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 electrical noise, things of this kind. What you learn here is the fact that uh, the a signal associated with the dark matter occurs at the dark matter mass, which is a fundamental physics parameter. Even though we don't know what it is, it's got nothing to do with anything human, right? So I can basically sit out there and listen to this particular frequency. If I see it, I'll be pretty convinced that what I'm seeing is dark matter because it's not associated with anything human. And there are many other things one can also do to verify the cosmic origin of these things. But that is the basic plot. But you can ask this question, right? Why do I care about naturalness? Great, naturalness is a fantastic philosophy. You know, we, we, we spent 30 years looking for it. But look, the reality is the world is pretty uh, unnatural. It looks like it, right? The, uh, we spent 40 years going after supersymmetry, didn't get anywhere. Uh, we went after uh, the cosmological constant problem. Uh, pretty clearly tells us that uh, the cosmological constant is, you know, we can't see any symmetry reason why the cosmological constant is small. There can be dynamical reasons, but we don't see symmetry reasons for it, okay? So you can ask the hard-nosed question, who cares about symmetry? Who cares about naturalness? right? Uh, who cares about naturalness? Uh, why should I believe any of this? If you're an experimentalist, that's the attitude you should have. Who cares about your philosophy? So even though theoretically I wrote down seven possible interactions, it turns out that experimentally, even if you did not give a damn about naturalness, there are an even smaller number of ways in which a, a dark matter particle can interact with us. Okay. So really all we're asking is the following. If I want to understand experimentally, ignoring all this theory stuff, experimentally, what can, I, what can I do to detect this dark matter, right? We're simply asking the following question. The dark matter is a classical field, is a time-varying classical field. How can a time-varying classical field interact with the standard model? What can we do to detect it? So uh, let's ask that question. What can an oscillating dark matter field do to standard model particles? Well, the first thing it can do is it can exert forces on electrons, okay? And it can create a small circuit, uh, so, sorry, small current in a circuit. That could happen. A classical field can come in and move currents back and forth. Uh, a classical field can come in and also make a spin that of standard model particles wobble back and forth. It can exert direct forces on standard model particles. And finally, it can also change the values of fundamental constants, right? So if I have electron mass, things of that kind, there could be a modulus associated with it, and I can change the values of these parameters. There is one more effect that I've not written down here. That's, that's only because it's very well studied, which has to do with the fact that uh, is, is, is these fields can also produce light directly. It looks like there's a question, so I will take it. Yeah, so Muzamil is asking, can, we uh, can dark matter decay? Yes, it can. It's a particle and like any other particle, it could decay. Uh, and uh, basically uh, we, again, have no evidence that it has decayed. Uh, depending upon what it has, what it could have decayed into, there are limits on these things. So the dark matter, let's say is, uh, you know, uh, one TeV in mass, just as an example, uh, and it decays into uh, 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 electrons and positrons. Uh, those things could have come and they would have been seen in cosmic ray detectors. So depending upon what it decays into and its actual lifetime, 
there are various limits on these things, but there is no fundamental reason why it has to be around forever. All we know is that it's around today. That's all. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a nice one. Uh, so, uh... If it changes fundamental constants, uh, would you be able to distinguish uh, um, these uh, effects from something which leads uh, maybe a special relativity is only approximate and uh, maybe Lorentz invariance is violated? So those kind of things, can you uh, yeah, yeah. distinguish between this? Yeah. Good, because this thing will oscillate at a frequency. It will move back and forth at, say, a megahertz, right? So why should a violation of special relativity change back and forth in a megahertz? Right, right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, so the fact that this is time dependent is extremely important, uh, not just from that fundamental point of view that you were asking, but just in terms of like regular noise, right? Like, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things happening in the world. So how do I distinguish this from other random sources of noise that I may mistake for dark matter? And indeed, it's, it's things like this, the frequency, things of that sort are very important. All right, so these are the four dominant uh, ways in which a classical field can can uh, affect the standard model, right? Like this, is, and, and this has no philosophy of naturalness associated with it, right? This is what I can do. This is how standard model particles can be changed by a classical field. And this is where things are very even more exciting because think about the following: if I create a small current in a circuit, that small current will create a magnetic field. If I take a spin and I move the spin back and forth, the motion of that spin will also create a small magnetic field as it wobbles back and forth. Both of those I can measure with very precise magnetometers of the kind that I talked about in the very beginning, these squid magnetometers that have made tremendous progress over the last 30 years or so. Similarly, if I exert direct forces on an object, uh, I can measure that with a very precise accelerometer, like these optical and atomic interferometers that we talked about. And if I change the values of fundamental constants, those will also show up in these optical and atomic interferometers because if you ask, how does an optical interferometer fundamentally work? How does it measure the distance between two objects? Well, it does so by measuring that distance in units of the frequency of light, right? That's what a laser interferometer is. It's basically saying the distance between points A and B are measured as to be so many units of the frequency of light or the wavelength of light. So the value of the fundamental constant like alpha changes, the frequency of the light or the wavelength of the light itself will change. So even if two points are not move, physically moving, my ruler that I'm using to measure the distance between them will change, right? And thus it is the case that uh, uh, if a fundamental constant is actually changing, that will also show up in these optical and atomic interferometers. So that is the plot of the story is that I'm gonna use these things, uh, you know, uh, 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 squid magnetometers and optical interferometers to go and look for these effects. And uh, the key point that we're going to use repeatedly to distinguish this from other kinds of noise is the fact that this signal exists at a specific frequency, the dark matter frequency, and it's very narrow, right? We talked about how uh, uh, there's a resonance that's about 10 to the 6 uh, in size. So we're looking for a resonant peak, uh, or like in this frequency space, which it would be hard to mimic by any of the source of noise. And that's also persistent forever. That's the key idea. All right, so let me talk about a series of experiments that are currently underway. Uh, the first experiment I'll talk about is the cosmic axion spin precession experiment or CASPER. And this is now a pretty big activity. Uh, there's a number of people working on this funded by all these dudes uh, as put out here. All right, so what does CASPER do? As the name suggests, CASPER is looking for spin precession. So let's talk about, uh, you know, a particle like a neutron. Okay, and let's consider a general axion. General axion means it is a particle that is coupled to the axial current here, n bar gamma mu gamma phi n, coupling to d mu a, all right? And uh, so let's take a neutron, and suppose I have this uh, dark matter field moving through the neutron, right? Uh, so the dark matter is a velocity, it's going through the neutron, and, and the dark matter and the axion interact in this particular way. So you take this operator, you write that down in the non-relativistic limit, and you write that down in the non-relativistic limit, this is how that interaction looks like. So there's a velocity dotted in the spin of the neutron. That's what this coupling becomes. So if you look at that interaction, that's a lot like how a magnetic field would interact with a spin, right? V dot S. So what this means is that as the dark matter goes through, because of this V dot S coupling, the spin will wobble back and forth, just like how a magnetic field will cause a spin to process. 
if there is this kind of interaction, the axion velocity will also cause the spin to wobble back and forth. Okay. And you can kind of look at current limits and see how large these fields are. These fields are typically around 10 to the minus 16 Tesla, assuming certain interactions that are not ruled out by current data. And that's interesting, again, because those are the kinds of magnetic fields that we're actually physically able to measure. Uh, other kinds of dark matter, for example, these dark photons that we talked about, this F prime field that I talked about, will also induce similar spin precession. If the neutron happened to have a dipole moment, for example, under this new gauge interaction, and uh, that particle was going through you, that's a new dark magnetic or electric field, and the neutron had a magnetic or electric dipole moment under that new interaction, that dark field will now cause your spin of the neutron to wobble back and forth. Uh, the second interaction we're interested in is the QCD axion itself. So the QCD axion, I didn't discuss this earlier, but the key point about the QCD axion is that it couples to QCD. That's why it's called that. It's couples to GG dual, the QCD field strength, A over F GG dual. And uh, what does that do? Well, if A is a dark matter field, it's the uh, dark matter axion, then you just simply put an A naught cosine MP over there, which then gives rise to a time dependent coefficient for GG dual. Uh, you might recognize that GG dual, of course, is the source of the so called theta term of QCD. And if there's a theta term of QCD, that would give rise to an electric dipole moment for neutrons and protons, right? That's the famous strong CP problem, uh, the fact that that happens to be very small, uh, but it's the same physics. So there's an A or F GG dual. And if there's an A sitting out here and the A is oscillating back and forth, there will now be a time dependent electric dipole moment for neutrons and protons coming from the dark matter itself. So what can you do to see this? Well, this electric dipole moment is along the nuclear spin. That is the only vector that is available, the only pseudo vector that's available. And so what you can do is that you can apply an electric field. Okay. Now a magnetic dipole will process around a magnetic field. Similarly, an electric dipole, if it exists, will process around an, an electric field, right? So the basic idea is that if, you, if, if, if this interaction does exist, you apply an electric field, you expect the neutron to wobble back and forth around it. So in both these cases, the key point is that if somehow I'm able to measure the spin rotation caused by the dark matter, I can detect the dark matter. That's the main idea. Any questions about this? Okay, I'll move on. How does Casper hope to detect the spin precession? So here's the idea. You take some material, you align all the nuclear spins in one direction. Uh, theoretically for us, that's very easy to say. Experimentally, that's a very complicated thing to do, but people can do, can do it in some systems. And here's what you do, right? Uh, you just have the dark matter do its thing. So you take all these spins, the spins, let's say, are aligned in this direction. The dark matter flows this way. Okay, either it is this axion velocity that in fact we talked about for general axions, or I can apply some electric field uh, in this system. And the dark matter actually is present and it's doing what we think it's supposed to be doing. It will then cause all these spins to rotate. As these spins rotate, their magnetic field will also change. And I can measure that transverse magnetization very accurately using this squid uh, or, uh, or some kind of magnetometer very accurately. Okay. And you can kind of see how there is a natural possibility of a resonance here, which is that the dark matter field oscillates back and forth at a frequency equal to its mass. And if you apply a background magnetic field in this particular system, the spins naturally want to process at what is called the Larmor precession frequency, mu b. Okay, that's a standard thing that in, happens in NMR. And so uh, in general, you don't know the mass of the dark matter, uh, things of that sort. So what you do is that you sit out there and you keep changing the value of the magnetic field. As you keep changing the value of this applied magnetic field, the resonance frequency of this NMR setup keeps changing. And what you're hoping for is that at one particular value of B, right, which is where the cosmic axion happens to be, there's a resonance. And when there's a resonance, there will be a larger magnetic field response of the system than what you previously had. Okay, so that's kind of how the system works is that you pick a value of the magnetic field, you try to see if there is anything going on, and then you keep tuning that magnetic field a little bit by little bit and seeing if there is one place where there is a big signal happening. It's a lot like how you tune a radio, right? You're generally in some random location, there's just some static noise 
frequencies you're getting, you keep tuning your radio until you hit the frequency of the radio station where you hit a resonance, which is where you see your signal. So this is looking for exactly the same kind of idea, uh, except we're looking for the cosmic radio station here and not uh, you know, your local uh, whatever radio station you listen to. So that's basically how Casper works. And uh, the reason why I'm very excited about it is because uh, you know, Casper has the ability to uh, search for a large variety of axions over a pretty large range of frequencies. So I won't really spend too much time on these slides. The important part about this slide is basically there's a lot of white space that you're able to cover, right? And that's my philosophy. The dark matter, we don't know very much about it. So we must be thinking about technological ways to cover as much parameter space as possible. Uh, same with this ability to search for the QCD axion as well, uh, where phase two of this experiment hopes to actually get to the QCD line itself and cover a significant range of masses for QCD. Uh, stuff is actually going on. This is not just theory. Uh, the Casper experiment has been around now for four to five years, and uh, there's like real data happening over there with continuing progress being made. So I won't spend too much time on it because you guys are more string theorists, but uh, this sort of let you know that things are actually uh, happening. Let me now switch to the next topic, which is uh, uh, an experiment called DM radio, okay? It's the idea of how to detect something called the dark photon with a radio of some kind. This also is funded by all these guys. There are probably more uh, people I should put up here, uh, uh, you know, who are funding us, but uh, let, let's not talk about that just yet. All right, so what is uh, Sorry, the, DM radio? the previous experiment that you described uh, is based where? Oh, the, so Casper is actually happening in Boston University as well as at uh, JJU in Mainz. Okay. Uh, that's the Johannes Gutenberg University. Uh, and I think we, in fact, we have colleagues in Shanghai and a few other places as well. Okay. But, but, that's, but that's where the main setup is actually happening. Yeah. Uh, DM radio is being built at Slack. All right. Uh, uh, so. Uh, here, the, we're trying to find a, what's called a dark photon, right? And the dark photon is a statement. So here's the Lagrangian, it's very simple. F is electromagnetism, F prime is the new gauge interaction. Uh, the new guy has a uh, you know, mass. So there's an M squared, A prime squared that I've written down. And uh, I couple these two sectors through a kinetic mixing. That's how I wrote it initially. That's a technically natural way of writing it. You can obviously do a, a uh, uh, basis redefinition and write that in terms of the mass basis. In terms of the mass basis, this is what it looks like. A standard model particles, a standard model current, JMU electromagnetism, they're coupled to electromagnetism, of course, as you're supposed to. But when you do the you know, uh, basis redefinition, uh, rediagonalization, what you basically see is that all standard model particles, electrons, protons, things of that kind, uh, that, that carry electromagnetism, they carry a small charge as well under this new gauge interaction. That's what it looks like. So from the experimental point of view, all you're saying is that, look, the world has a new dark photon. It's a new photon. This photon has a small mass and it has very small couplings to all charged particles. That, that's what's going on here, okay, epsilon. And how do you find such a thing? Well, I know that an, that an, 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 an electric field creates currents. So presumably a dark electric field will also create small currents. And the key point is that if I build a shield, that shield will block regular electromagnetism. But uh, you know, uh, since the coupling of the dark matter with regular electrons in a shield is very small, the shield will presumably not block the dark electric field. The dark electric field will go through. So, but it can still drive currents behind an electromagnetic shield. So that's the main idea. I'm trying to uh, detect a dark electric field inside a shield. So here is the picture. Uh, the dark matter is assumed to be this dark electric field. This dark electric field is oscillating everywhere. That's where its energy density is. And I put and I build a shield. And inside the shield, I stick in an LC oscillator, okay, a radio essentially. So uh, uh, the idea would be that the dark matter comes in, standard model gets blocked by the shield. The dark matter goes through. It excites this LC oscillator. Once again, I don't know the frequency of the LC oscillator. Uh, I, I don't know the frequency of the dark matter. So I just have a tunable LC oscillator, just like a regular radio. So I'm sitting out there and tuning the LC oscillator, hoping okay, that at one particular frequency, I hear the cosmic dark matter. Uh, that's the DM radio experiment. And uh, again, progress is happening on this front. This is uh, a, 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 a relatively large activity now. And the key point is there's lots of uh, 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 white space that I can cover this technology. 
And this is sort of recent data from these guys. Uh, this, of course, is not the, uh, we, we didn't find the dark matter. Okay, that's not what the spike is. That's just a thermal noise in our setup, uh, which sets our actual noise floor. Uh, uh, but you can kind of see that stuff is actually happening. All right. Uh, the third topic I'm going to talk about in this thing is called the, how to detect dark matter with accelerometers. Okay. Uh, this is now being built in uh, the University of Washington, people at Stanford and Fermilab as well. Uh, so the other coupling that's of interest is something like a B minus L coupling. Okay, there are variations of this one can write, uh, but basically uh, it says the standard model particles have a charge under this B minus L interaction. And the B minus L, unlike electromagnetism, has the fact that in electromagnetism, electrons and protons are charged, neutrons and neutrinos are neutral. Uh, under B minus L, protons, neutrons, electrons, and neutrinos, they all have charge under B minus L. It looks like there's a question. Yeah, so let me read it out. Uh, so why particularly LC oscillator and not any other type? Oh, uh, well, in the sense that I'm trying to detect a small current, right? And uh, so, you know, how do you create an oscillator for currents? LC oscillators are the, are the simplest things you can do. So Casper notice is a resonator, uh, but it's not, it's, the, it's, a, it's a resonator with, with sort of NMR in the sense that we have a, a spins, and we're applying a magnetic field and it's that kind of resonance that we're creating. Uh, so I'm using an LC oscillator simply because I'm interested in currents. So another question or? No, that was just a comment. Uh, it's okay, yeah, carry on. Great. Uh, right, so uh, under B minus L, all these guys are charged. And uh, what that implies is that if you take an electrically neutral atom, an electrically neutral atom will also be charged under B minus L because of the net neutron number that it carries, right? So uh, if you have, you know, uh, I don't know, helium uh, atom, a helium atom, electrons, and the, uh, the, the electromagnetism, of course, is neutralized. But because it has a net neutron number under B minus L, uh, there will be a charge for this particular thing, which means if you take two electrically neutral atoms, uh, they will be charged under B minus L. People, of course, look for these kinds of new forces all the time. And those constrain these gauge couplings to be very small. And so we're basically asking, uh, can we do better than this kind of coupling? So how do we think about it? Well, there's an oscillating uh, B minus L field, let us say. That means there's an oscillating electric field associated with it. That's the dark matter. And because your atoms now carry charge under this dark matter, uh, the dark electric field will directly cause accelerations on this particular atom. And that is something one can go look for. Uh, this force, of course, depends upon the net neutron number in the system, because that's what the charge is. And that therefore violates the equivalence principle. Okay, uh, Of course, it's not a big thing. It's just helpful in terms of experimentally thinking about it. Uh, because what you would basically say is that, ah, there is now a dark matter field around me, and the dark matter is exerting a time-dependent equivalence principle violating force on matter directly. This is not a gravitational force. It's just a direct force. So it's not surprising it violates equivalence principle, but that's what it looks like. The other particle we can think about is the relaxion, okay, uh, and uh, or the Higgs portal coupling, and that is just the fact that I can write down some g phi Higgs squared, all right. And uh, what does that look like? Well, let's see what that looks like. Uh, I write some g phi Higgs squared. The Higgs, of course, gives rise to masses for all the fundamental particles. So there's a g phi uh, multiplying quark masses, things of this kind. And if phi is a dark matter, I put in phi cosine mt, right? And that basically means there will be a time dependence as well as a spatial dependence on this mass, because as we said, the dark matter is wobbling back and forth in space as well. And so if I look at this particular coupling, I can now in the Lagrangian take a spatial variation. There's now, uh, because there's now a spatial gradient, what you realize is that different quarks at different locations will have a slightly different mass, slightly different potential. If there's, a if, there's, if there's a spatially varying potential, that of course corresponds to a force. And therefore there's now going to be a force on atoms that is of the form G grad phi, uh, 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 which effectively corresponds to the fact that there's a velocity, okay, of the dark matter directly exerting a force on standard model particles. That's what that looks like. Once again, this is some interaction that goes with the Higgs. It doesn't care about gravity. Uh, so it's not a surprise that this will violate the equivalence principle so once again, we get a time-dependent equivalence principle violation. 
The reason why I'm bringing up the equivalence principle violation is because there are many experiments that are currently looking for equivalence principle violation. And therefore, one can actually just simply co-opt those particular experiments and uh, try to find this kind of dark matter. So here is an experiment that's actually happening at the University of Washington. Uh, so they take two elements, okay, titanium and beryllium. Uh, so titanium and beryllium, they're different neutron to proton ratios. Uh, and what and here's what uh, uh, you know will happen in a dark matter setup. So because the force exerted by dark matter cares about whether this is titanium versus beryllium, sorry, rather the acceleration cares about whether this is titanium versus beryllium. Uh, if there is this dark matter actually doing this, and I take this particular system, you will notice that because the acceleration of titanium is different from the acceleration from beryllium on beryllium, this particular balance will get twisted. Right, there's a different acceleration on this guy versus that guy, so this guy will, you know, get twisted a little bit, and you can measure that angle, the angle of twisting, okay, through optical interferometers. So that is one thing you can go and measure. The second thing you can do is you can take two atoms and drop them. So an experiment that is being done at Stanford involves them taking rubidium eighty-five and rubidium eighty-seven, and they're actually doing Galileo's experiment. You know, Galileo is famously supposed to have gone to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropped two different objects and uh, he is supposed to have shown that both these things fell at the same rate. Okay, uh, so these guys are taking rubidium eighty-five and rubidium eighty-seven, and they're dropping them, and they're going to see if one of them falls faster than the other. Okay, and they're going to do that to extraordinary precision of like thirteen digits, as opposed to what Galileo was able to do. And so uh, the key thing about this whole setup is that uh, one of the main things here is that if you ask, right, uh, um, how is the dark matter signal different? from the typical things these guys are looking for. So usually these guys are looking for a new force between the earth and the atom. So for example, if I look at this atom interferometer experiment, they're trying to see if there's a new long range force between the earth and the atoms that is different from gravity. Now, in general, if you take rubidium 85 and rubidium 87 and you drop it, you will indeed in general find that one of them falls faster than the other. Now, that is not because you've discovered a new force of nature, uh, it is often the case that it's very difficult for you to drop 85 and 87 from exactly the same point in space, right? In general, you'll drop 85, say a little bit below 87. If you did that, because the earth is a sphere, there is a slightly different gravitational gradient, right? This is a, or, 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 or rather there's a gravity gradient, which basically means that the acceleration experienced by 85 will be somewhat different from the acceleration experienced by 87, simply because of the fact that the earth is a sphere. So the fact that rubidium 85 falls somewhat faster than 87 by itself does not mean you've discovered a new force of nature. It just means the earth is a sphere, right? So this is a serious problem in a lot of these experiments that constrains your sensitivity because of the fact that there are all these gravity gradient noise around you. For dark matter, this particular problem can be kind of solved in an interesting way because the dark matter signal is oscillating back and forth in time. So let's say I take rubidium 85 and 87 and I drop them. Even if I don't drop them from the same location in space, the dark matter signal will keep changing in time, right? So let's say the dark matter oscillates at a frequency of one Hertz, which means every second or so, rubidium 85 will go faster than 87 and then 87 will go faster than 85, right? So because of that time variation, you realize that it's very, very hard to mock that up by conventional sources of systematics, these experiments. And that's really why searching for the dark matter allows these guys to probe quite a bit better than what they can conventionally do for equivalence principle violation itself because of that time variance. Uh, another activity that's going on with a lot of strength these days is called pulsar timing arrays. So pulsar timing arrays are experiments that are actually uh, put out there in order to go and search for gravitational waves. It may even be the case that they've found gravitational waves with pulsar timing arrays. There are all these rumors going around these days. How do they work? The basic idea is that there are these neutron stars or pulsars that are far away from us, and they are spinning in an extremely stable way. Their rotation is extremely stable because they're enormous and they are spinning very, very rapidly. So they are very good clocks. Okay, They kind of come to us at exactly the same rate. And what the pulsar timing array does is basically that this guy, okay, emits up a radio wave towards us. And on the earth, we're sitting there and listening to that radio wave. And we're trying to see if the distance between, uh, so well, if a gravitational wave, let's say goes through, that's what they're looking for. The distance between the pulsar and the earth will change, which will change the time of arrival 
of these periodic radio pulses. That's what they're looking for, right? And uh, that's what they're looking for to find gravitational waves. The dark matter will also do something very similar, right? The dark matter can exert direct forces on these neutron stars, which will cause the distance between the neutron star and the Earth to wobble. And therefore, the time of arrival will keep changing. Secondly, if the uh, particle like the relaxion, okay, one of these Higgs portal things actually is the dark matter, that will change the value of the electron mass on the Earth because the dark matter is oscillating back and forth. It changes the value of the electron mass here locally. And that means that even if the distance between the Earth and the pulsar is actually not physically changing, the clock that I'm using to measure the time of arrival, because the clock I'm using is an atomic clock, the atomic clock ticks at a rate given by the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, proportional to the fine structure constant. So the fine structure constant itself is changing in time. The time of arrival will also be measured to be fluctuating back and forth. And that is a way in which you can actually use pulsar timing arrays to also go and search for this kind of dark matter. Okay, so once question. again, I'm interested in how much white space we're able to cover. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't follow this idea that the uh, interaction with the uh, 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 dark matter wave can change the fundamental constants. Ah, good. I so, yeah, yeah. So a simple example would be, uh, you know, let's look at it here. So uh, this is my Lagrangian G phi Higgs squared. The Higgs, of course, gives rise to masses of fundamental particles. So when yes. you, you know, give it a VEV, all of that stuff, you will find there's an effective coupling between phi and quark masses of this kind, G phi, quark mass, Q, Q, Q bar, for example. Right. And when this is the dark matter, right? I'm putting in a phi cosine MT which means there will now be a time varying quark mass, for example. Okay. And when the, and, and, and okay, this is also true for the electron as well, right? It's not just the quark, the Higgs gives yes. masses to all of these things. Right. So right. what that now means is that there is a time varying electron mass, which I would call that a time variation of fundamental constant. What about the electric charge? Ah, so for that, I, I've write on a different interaction. That would be phi F squared. Okay, okay. And F squared, the coefficient of F squared, of course, is the fine structure constant. So when yes. phi is oscillating, uh, okay. that will also change. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Uh, all right. So now, again, the interesting thing is we are able to cover a lot of white space from about 10 to the minus 22 electron volts all the way to about 10 to the minus 16 well, actually 10 to the minus 12, I would say, depending upon how sensitive you want to be. So that's, uh, again, uh, that's an activity that's happening with, with a lot of interest in both Stanford as well as uh, the University of Washington and a few other groups also uh, around the world now. Okay, so uh, that's sort of the first part of my talk which dealt a lot with ultralight dark matter. I'm now going to switch gears and talk about uh, two other uh, problems. One is uh, uh, the problem of how do we go beyond the solar neutrino floor for WIMP dark matter. And uh, 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 you know, uh, the next thing we'll talk about is essentially how do we find dark matter in this range, 10 to the minus four EV to about a GEV or so. So I'll pause for a second to take any questions if there are any about the first part of this talk. All right, looks like people are happy. All right, so let me briefly highlight these two physical points as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, as we said, right, Enormous range of possibilities. Oh, there's a question. I should give one second, but there's a question. Uh, isn't the, uh, Loga is asking, isn't the violation of time translation invariance constrained by how well energy conservation is known to be true? Ah, well, uh, you know, uh, the thing is, if you look at it, right, ultimately there is some dark matter out there that is oscillating back and forth. And that's just what's out there. And you're asking, uh, if I have a particular object in my world and I'm trying to measure its energy, you're absolutely correct that the, an interaction between the dark matter and us will cause at some level a fluctuation in things like energy because I'm driving, I'm driving the system back and forth. But these are, in fact, the experiments I propose are, in fact, the most sensitive ways to actually measure those violations, right? Because at the end of the day, the dark matter has to couple to us. And uh, if there is no coupling, standard model particles will not experience any fluctuation in that energy. And now we're simply asking this question, what is the best way to constrain it? 
And experimentally, it turns out that uh, uh, detecting a phase is much easier than measuring directly a frequency shift, uh, which is why these are a better way of probing it than directly looking for, for violations of, 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 of energy conservation, uh, mostly because these numbers are incredibly small, right? They're like, uh, so a simple way to think about this is that if I have some experimental system, uh, there's a temperature that's around us. The temperature is, let's say, 300 Kelvin, or even if I cool it a lot, uh, let's say I get it to a milli Kelvin, uh, that is still 10 to the minus, you know, 6 EV, something like this, right? So I'm expecting in any system violations of energy conservation happening just from thermal effects at that very large rate, okay? The dark matter rate is way smaller than any of that. So that's why those, that's not the right way experimentally to find it. Okay, another question. No, that's Loga saying, okay, thanks. Yeah, carry on. Great. Great, okay, all right. All right, so the next thing to talk about is weakly interacting massive particles or WIMP dark matter. So, you know, uh, the, the WIMP could very easily be the dark matter, right? There, even though we have looked at it for 30, 40 years and haven't found it, uh, right now we are probing the possibility of the WIMP interacting standard model through the Higgs, okay? And, uh, the, you know, that's a very real possibility. And we are only about, I would say, half the way in probing this particular possible interaction. And the key difficulty for these guys now is the fact that uh, 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 if you look at a WIMP experiment, there is a target mass that the WIMP comes, it scatters, and that's what you're looking for. And uh, we, of course, live next to the sun for good reasons. The sun produces neutrinos. These neutrinos will also come and scatter and do exactly the same thing. Right, so it uh, so with the cross sections we are now probing, it is the case that pretty soon in the next generation uh, we're going to have neutrinos from the sun coming and scattering. We will be able to see that, but the fact that neutrinos in the dark matter scatter in a very similar way means we will no longer be able to find dark matter scattering because they look very similar unless we do something a little different. So the question is, how do you probe beyond the solar neutrino floor for dark matter? The next uh, thing that we talked about is that uh, all the experiments I've discussed so far, they were actually looking for dark matter in a mass range from 10 to the minus 22 EV to about 10 to the minus 4 EV or so. And these were very, very low mass particles with incredibly low couplings. Yet I was able to make progress in trying to see them. Notice that I didn't actually talk about dark matter in this mass range, 10 to the minus 4 EV to 100 EV or GEV, things of that kind. Why is that? So this actually, to some extent, uh, ties to Loga's question, uh, which is that the main way these experiments were able to make all this progress is because if you thought about it, the time for which the signal was coherent, right, which is one over mb squared, right, that is how long I have to measure this particular signal before it changes dramatically, that depends upon the mass of the particle. So the lower the mass, the larger the time I have to sit and measure something. And that time could be a microsecond to about a million years, depending upon the mass of the dark matter, which we don't know. But that is the main point about the low frequency end, is that I have time to measure a small signal. As the mass goes higher and higher, this time gets smaller and smaller. And thus, even if the energy being deposited is bigger, the time is so tiny that I can't use these same techniques to go after dark matter in this mass range. So we basically require new ways to probe these two parts of parameter space. So let me talk about how one can do directional detection of dark matter with crystal defects. Uh, this is actually now happening uh, uh, by Ron's Wal Ron Walsworth. He's the key lead on this. Uh, it's being built at the University of Maryland as well as uh, with some beam time at, at the Argonne National Labs. So here is the main uh, thing, the solar neutrino problem, right? So how do we find WIMP dark matter? There's experiments like xenon, things of this kind. So you take a detector, there's a bunch of material, the dark matter comes in, it hits some nucleus and scatters. And these guys are extremely good. They're able to find a single scattering in a large block of material. Okay, it's incredible technology. Uh, you're looking at like one event per year, right? Very, very precise. And the problem is the neutrino will do exactly the same thing, right? The dark matter comes, it scatters, it kicks off this nucleus and the dark matter goes in its merry way. It does nothing else. So this is very different from, let's say, any other background. So you may worry about, say, alpha particles, electrons, all these kinds of things. 
what they will do is that they will come and scatter, say uh, some alpha particle comes in, it scatters. It won't just hit one nucleus, it'll hit a whole bunch of nuclei. So these WIMP guys, they're very good at knowing whether it was a single event or multiple scattering. So if multiple things got knocked out, you'll be like, okay, that is not the dark matter or something else. Uh, so that's how they're able to make progress against a variety of standard model backgrounds. The problem is the neutrino will do exactly what the dark matter is doing. The neutrino will come in, it'll hit exactly one nucleus if it does anything at all. And then that nucleus gets knocked off and the neutrino goes its merry way, which is exactly what the dark matter does. And so you're not able to distinguish neutrino scattering from dark matter scattering. And the sun produces neutrinos every time it undergoes a nuclear reaction. And uh, we can calculate how many neutrinos you should be getting from the sun. And what you realize is that with the known weak interaction cross sections, uh, in the next generation of dark matter detectors, they will hit, they'll, be, they'll, they'll begin to see neutrinos from the sun. And once you see neutrinos from the sun, you don't know if all you're doing is just this, whether you're seeing a neutrino or you're seeing dark matter. But what you can do is that if in principle, you're able to tell the direction of where this particle came from, you can distinguish the neutrino from the sun, from the dark matter, because we know where the sun is. Since you know where the sun is, if you're able to tell, ah, this particle came in from this direction, right? I can therefore put a veto. I can be like, look, let me ignore all events that point from the sun. If that is the case, I'll just ignore it, right? They're probably neutrinos. The dark matter on the other hand is isotropic. It's coming from all directions. So I'm only going to look at events that are pointing away from the sun. As long as that is the case, I will be able to tell that this is dark matter and not solar neutrinos. So the key point is that if somehow you're able to tell the direction of this nuclear recoil, you will be able to make progress. The challenge, of course, in this whole business is that in order to even be in the game of doing dark matter detection at this level, you require a lot of mass because you're looking at cross sections that are so small, 10 to the minus 45, 46 centimeters squared, that you require an enormous amount of material in order for you to have a probability that there will even be one scatter in a year, right? So the key challenge is that I need a ton scale detector. And in a ton scale detector, I have a single scattering, okay, a single recoil. And how do I tell what direction that nucleus scattered in one ton or really several ton of material? How do I do that? Okay. Uh, people are able to do that in gases because you know the, the mean free path is pretty long. You can do these things. But if I take, uh, a, if I build an experiment with one ton of gas, because the gas density is so small, the size of the detector will be physically enormous. So that's not practical. So what you require really is the ability to do directional detection at solid state densities. How do you do that? Okay. So uh, before we get into the technology, let's even look at what is actually going on, right? So the WIMP or the dark matter comes and scatters. Uh, I, I, I kick this nucleus out. That nucleus, what it will do, what does it do? It goes and hits other nuclei, right? So I kick this guy, that guy hits other parts of the lattice. They all get dislocated. So what is actually true is that when I kick this nucleus like this, uh, this nucleus creates a whole lot of damage around it. And it creates what is called a damage trail. Okay, it's a lot like taking a bullet and shooting it inside a block of wood or something. Wherever the bullet goes, it'll create a little trail of damage. And by identifying that trail of damage, you can figure out where, what direction the bullet actually came in, okay? The challenge here is that basically I'm depositing only about tens of keV of energy. So this bullet trail, as it were, is all within 50 nanometers. So if you're able to take a picture of what's going on within 50 nanometers, you're actually able to tell what direction this dark matter particle actually came in, all right? So I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go through this in too much detail, but you can kind of pictorially see why that basically makes sense. So the key challenge in doing all this is that I need some way to do nanoscale measurement, right? Within 50 nanometers or so, there is a very, very good signal that one can go look for, it's extremely strong, but I have to be able to localize and make measurements in a one ton scale solid. A one ton is a lot of mass. It's about like several meters uh, of, of, of material. And I need to be able to localize within 50 nanometers what's actually going on. It's the ideal sort of, is the, is the archetypical sort of uh, uh, needle in a haystack problem. So that's where this very interesting technology of what is called nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond becomes very interesting. So it's kind of roughly how it works. 
So you take diamond, okay, and uh, uh, so, 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 so this is not the fancy diamond that you give your uh, partner, okay, this is sort of industrial polycrystalline diamond. Uh, uh, and what you do in diamond is that it's a very nice carbon lattice, and you uh, uh, create some holes in it, they're called vacancies, these carbons are not where they're supposed to be. And then next to them, you put some nitrogen, okay, you're able to create this. If you know your chemistry, you basically know there's going to be some unpaired electron sitting out there. And uh, what is true is that you're able to shine light on this unpaired electron and you can measure its energy levels very, very accurately. Okay. So you basically take this uh, carbon, uh, take this diamond, uh, you create these holes, you put some nitrogen next to it. There are some unpaired electrons sitting around and you shine light on these electrons and you're able to study the energy levels of that light because as that laser shines through, uh, you know, the uh, like, that electron gets excited and de-excited and emits light. You collect that and you study it. Okay. What is true in this technology is that this electron here is very sensitive to electromagnetic fields at the nanometer scale. That's why these things were actually invented, right? They're able to make nanometer probes effectively of, of these kinds of crystal materials. Uh, and one can in fact create something like a pretty large density of NB centers in bulk diamond. So these are of course millimeter cube amounts of diamond. We're not talking about meter cube just yet, but at least the high densities that is required are, have been experimentally demonstrated. And uh, people have indeed, as I said, been able to make nanoscale measurements uh, 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 you know, around. And the question is, can this actually be used for directional detection? Because as we said, the signal in uh, when a dark matter scatters of a solid is that within 50 nanometers or so, there is this very strong bullet trail Okay, and look, now I have technology that is able to resolve something going at the 50 nanometer scale. So can I combine these two things? So I'll make a couple of comments. First, you might say, look, what am I talking about? I require a meter scale experiment to do any of these things. Uh, so am I really gonna go and get a meter, meter cube of diamond, right? If someone gave you a meter cube of diamond, would you be spending that time doing dark matter or would you decamp with that to the Cayman Islands and live your life happily ever after? So the key point is that the kind of diamond we need, as I said earlier, is not the diamond that you give your spouse. It is a, it is, it is a diamond that you use for industry. And so a meter cube of this kind of diamond is about $50 million. That's not cheap, but again, it's not insanely expensive, right? Uh, it, is, it is at the scale at which we typically do these kinds of experiments anyway. The material is not insane. And you can also do similar kinds of technology, not just with diamond, you can also do that with things like sodium iodide. So these are other uh, kind of crystal detectors that are used in a variety of other regular dark matter experiments anyway. So it's not totally crazy to think about this. Uh, so what does the signal look like? Well, this dark matter comes in, it scatters, it creates this damage trail. This damage trail will affect the uh, energy of this particular line. And that is basically what one can actually go and measure. So roughly what it looks like is that if you knock something off, okay, there is going to be some elastic strain in the material, which drops off as something like one over R cube. And effectively what that does is that it shifts the line, okay, by something like hundred kilohertz. So the line had some energy before, it changes by hundred kilohertz uh, when the damage trail is around 30 nanometers away. And that's about a hundred times larger than the natural line width of this particular uh, system. So locally, okay, in the 30 nanometer region or so, the signal to noise is something like 100 to one. It's a very, very strong signal because at the 30 nanometer scale, I've created a lot of damage. But the key point is, how do I find this needle in this gigantic haystack? So here's kind of the idea of what we're trying to do. We're gonna create some pretty large detectors, okay? So they're gonna be sections. So essentially what we think about is something like a meter squared area okay, with a thickness of only about a millimeter or so. And the idea is that we use conventional WIMP ideas, okay? Uh, the WIMP guys have been doing this for a long time. So when a WIMP or a neutrino, whatever comes and scatters, uh, they're able to localize the initial scattering to within about a millimeter or so. That's where this millimeter thickness comes in, okay? So within the first millimeter, it's not too difficult to know exactly where this event actually happens. And then you're gonna be like, okay, so something seems to have happened in this millimeter cube uh, over here. So let me just pull out that part of the detector. And then I'm gonna study that very, very intensively with all kinds of fancy laser scattering techniques. Again, in the interest of time, I don't, I'm not able to go into that in too much detail, but that's kind of what these guys generally do. 
right? So you're going to pull out this particular millimeter cube where you think something interesting happened. And then you st spend two days studying it very carefully to identify within that millimeter cube, where is the direction of the damage trail? And that is something one can actually do. Okay. Uh, so I won't go into more detail. Essentially, the idea is that uh, it appears possible that uh, with the, you know, uh, uh, one can actually get five sigma efficiency uh, with uh, this, this technology. And we're currently working towards creating a proof of concept of this particular setup. So with that, let me switch really to my final topic. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so these experiments uh, need to be done at uh, low temperature or room temperature? Uh, you can do them at, at uh, room temperature because basically if you think about it, right, the um, energy to create a uh, lattice vacancy is uh, something like, you know, uh, tens of electron volts, which is basically, you know, uh, 6,000 Kelvin. So once you create them, they're extremely thermodynamically stable. So that's the key difference between a solid versus a liquid. And in a liquid, I couldn't do it. Okay. And another question that I had was that uh, you're talking about terrestrial-based experiments, but are they similar? Uh, would there be any advantage in trying to do these experiments maybe on the International Space Station? Oh, there would be much worse because basically you would get cosmic rays as well. So uh, these guys do them deep underground precisely because they want to actually block uh, all kinds of cosmic rays going in and creating damage. So these things have been done like essentially, you know, uh, several kilometers. I mean, not several, several you. hundred meters under the ground. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So let me uh, switch to the last part of my topic, which is a topic of what is called a magnetic bubble chamber. And uh, this is really being built uh, by Rupak Mahapatra at the Texas A&M University right now. So here was the question that was of interest to me. How do I cover this region from 10 to the minus four electron volts to about, 100, uh, to about a GeV or so, right? The key problem here was that the coherence time of the signal was so short for me to do the conventional phase measurements that I was doing for the low frequency ends of things. So how do I probe this particular region? So this region is difficult because the coherence time is too small for these ideas. At the same time, the energy being deposited, because the mass of dark matter is so small over here, the energy being deposited is too tiny to be used for conventional BIMP calorimeter, the kinds of things that we've actually been doing for BIMP dark matter so far. So what we need, in my opinion, is an amplifier, right? I'm depositing small amounts of energy, milli EV to a KEV, and somehow I need to amplify this deposit of energy to be able to see it. Now, the real challenge is that if you're in the dark matter business, you uh, need to create an amplifier in a large target mass. And uh, not only do you need this to be in a large target mass, you're looking for very rare events. You're looking for one event per year, okay? Which means whatever amplifier you're creating has to be very stable. So the amplifier by itself cannot keep going off randomly because if it keeps going off randomly, you won't know if what you saw was dark matter versus this amplifier is going off randomly. So how do you create an amplifier in a large target mass that is sufficiently stable for several years? How do you do that? That's a technology. So let me now give you a concept and uh, uh, then I'll tell you why it's not nuts, okay? So suppose you take a magnet with all of its spins aligned and let's do the following. Let's now take this uh, magnet and I put a magnetic field in the opposite direction. When you do that, you notice that all of these spins are now in a metastable state, right? They have energy G mu B. They're now in some uh, you know, uh, excited state of the, of the system. Say the dark matter comes, it collides. As it collides, it deposits some heat. And suppose that heat actually causes some of these spins to flip, okay? So some of these spins will flip. As the spins flip, they will release their stored Zeeman energy, right? Because these are excited state spins. When the spins flip, they release the stored Zeeman energy. And perhaps that released energy causes nearby spins to also flip. And that gives rise to a flame or a magnetic deflagration or a burning of the material, right? So this, this, so this is not a chemical burning, right? In a, in, a, in a chemical burn, that's what you do. You take something, you, you, you only heat up a small part of it, but the release heat releases the cost of the fuel to release more energy, which then burns up the rest of the system. So that's a chemical burn. What we're now asking is, can magnetic spins also similarly burn? Okay, that's the question. So the cartoon is, I take a bunch of spins, apply a magnetic field, I flip a small number of spins that just causes the rest of the system's flips, spins to also flip. Is that actually possible? 
That of course amplifies the locally deposited energy because I'm only starting off by flipping a small number of initial spins, and then that then leads to an even more uh, 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 a set of spins to actually flip. Okay, so is this possible? It's a science fiction. All right. So uh, what kind of technology will actually happen to actually make this possible? So this, of course, will not happen in a ferromagnet. In a ferromagnet, these spins are strongly coupled to each other. Okay, and uh, because they are strongly coupled to each other, uh, you know, if 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 a, if a single spin actually flips, that will actually not cause its neighboring spins to flip. That's not going to happen. Spins are strongly coupled. What we require is weak spin-spin coupling, right? So uh, because it's strongly coupled, uh, one spin flipping will not cause a neighbor to flip. Now I can't use a gas, right? A gas will of course have weak spin-spin uh, coupling, but what I require is that when I release energy, that energy has to be efficiently transported to the neighbor. So I require large heat conduction. At the same time, I need weak spin-spin coupling, all right? So you can't use a gas, you can't use a ferromagnet. That's why you need chemists, okay? So as you know, there's a field called chemistry, and uh, you could, what turns out what you need is something called an organometallic complex, uh, which basically is something that I remember studying for my chemistry classes uh, <laughs> back in the day when I was a high school student in India. Uh, so these things essentially have, and I never thought that would ever be useful, by the way, in my life, but it turned out to be very useful. Uh, so what an organometallic complex is basically is that you have a central metal atom, a uh, complex really, and surrounding that is a large number of organic material. Okay, that's what's actually going on here. And the reason why this is interesting is because of this large organic material around me, the distance between the spins is quite a bit further away than they would be in a ferromagnet. Okay, which means, and since the interaction drops off as one over R cube, uh, as these spins are split up a little bit, uh, there will be effectively the case that uh, the spin spin coupling is weak. Even though the spin spin coupling is weak, because of this organic material around me, it can still efficiently conduct heat. Right? So I basically accomplished the fact that I have weak spin-spin coupling, but with large heat conduction. And uh, so essentially that means that each molecule in the system uh, acts as an independent magnet. And that's why these things get a name called single molecule magnets. And chemists can actually make these. These are discovered in the late 1990s. And there's a huge uh, amount of chemistry actually going on on this stuff. So what's the basic physics of what's happening here? Uh, this is a system which can be described by a two-level Hamiltonian, spin up and spin down, of course. Uh, and they happen to be separated by some kind of energy barrier. What you now do is you apply a background magnetic field like we wanted to, which then makes one of these systems metastable. But because there is this barrier between them, if I place the spins in this metastable state, they can't immediately decay. They have to go through this barrier, all right? And that can happen only through tunneling. And because of that, uh, this is very, very suppressed. So if you look at the lifetime of the system, the lifetime basically goes as e to the some barrier height divided by temperature. That's what it looks like. So at low temperatures, this state is very, very long lived, right? Exponentially long lived. On the other hand, if I create some localized heating, if I locally increase the temperature that will, uh, and that goes above this barrier, the decay will be immediate. So effectively I have exponentially long lifetime at low temperature, but a deposit, a temp, uh, 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 but a small change in temperature will locally increase this, uh, uh, decrease the uh, lifetime by a lot, which causes all these spins to immediately decay, right? So, what is the lowest amount of heat that will actually do this? Well, this is a very simple calculation. What you're asking is that I take a small region and I uh, deposit heat locally. That locally deposited heat will increase the temperature locally. Two things can happen: either the temperature can diffuse from that region, the heat can diffuse from that region, causing it to lower the temperature. Or before the heat can diffuse out, the spins in that region can flip. When the spins flip, they will release the stored energy, and that stored energy will increase the temperature. So the key point is that thermal diffusion is, of course, a random walk. Okay. So if you take a large region and make that and, and increase that to the same temperature T, the amount of time it takes for that heat to diffuse out goes as lambda squared. Okay, well, lambda is a size that you heat it up to. On the other hand, if I'm just causing these spins to flip, the spin flip doesn't care about how large of a region I make hot. It only cares about the local parameter, which is the uh, barrier height, which doesn't care about the size that I'm heating up to. 
So for sufficiently large value of lambda, it is always the case the spin flip will happen more quickly than thermal diffusion, which means that for a sufficiently large lambda, if I heat that up, this deflagration, this heating will actually happen. This, this material will start undergoing magnetic burning. Okay, that is the main idea. All right, so uh, you can use those parameters. Okay, this effective temperature, this intrinsic relaxation, tau naught, et cetera. All of these will essentially tell you how much of a region I need to heat in order to actually make this possible. And again, the thing is with, with the variety of known materials, it is actually possible to get to the very, very low thresholds that we want as low as 0.01 EV or so. Okay, so uh, I won't go through this particular part. This is more for experimental interest, uh, uh, but the let me tell you what has been demonstrated in the lab. Okay, so what has been demonstrated in the lab is the following thing. Uh, we've basically now got a setup at Texas A&M where we have a uh, sensor for a magnetic field. Okay, if we take a sample, the sample is this uh, manganese acetate uh, crystal that we actually have, and we put a source. Okay, there's some radioactive source next to it. So what we actually have are two such setups. Okay. One of them, uh, there is no radioactive source. The other one has a radioactive source. And uh, uh, what we are doing is the following. We're basically saying, which one goes off? Which one has this magnetic deflagration actually happen? So this is real data that we actually see. What we see here is the following. The blue one, that is this manganese acetate system with no radioactive source next to it. So we have uh, put a magnetic field. We've got a Hall sensor, which measures the magnetic field. We're sitting out there. This thing sees no, no change in the magnetic field at all. While uh, the one with the source, what you see is that it's got a stable magnetic for, field for a while, and then you see a jump. Okay, And this jump is consistent with the activity of the radioactive source. Right. So what we are basically seeing is that, look, only when I actually have the radioactive material is my system responding in this particular way, allowing us to see this particular thing. So we are pretty excited about this particular concept and we are trying to take it forward more. We have some money from the DOE to do this. Uh, so that is kind of the main set of ideas that I talked about today is that uh, the thing that has defined a lot of my work over the last decade is that we have very, very poor observational constraints on dark matter. And there are a number of experiments under development today which can actually probe dark matter from about 10 to the minus 22 EV to about 10 to the minus six EV through a variety of these precision measurement tools. And uh, we are now exploring new concepts for how to do WIMP directional detection in solid state materials, as well as these single molecule magnets uh, for uh, you know somewhat heavier dark matter, but still pretty light. So with that, let me stop and I will answer more questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Sujit, for a very enlightening talk. Uh, so uh, we have time for questions. So let's uh, give a few seconds yeah, for yeah. people to gather their thoughts. Sure. So maybe I can uh, begin by asking a, a simple-minded question. So uh, you said that there are these couplings which will effectively give, uh, uh, there are certain couplings which would give uh, a photon an effective mass as well, so some, some time varying mass. Yes. Uh, so it's not so, a photon, it's really, it's really just, um, I put a new particle and yes. I, I just broke the gauge symmetry and I gave it a mass. Uh, right. Uh, and that does not translate into an effective mass for the photon. Uh, did I understand no. correctly? Maybe I misunderstood something. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, that does not. So what it looks like is the fact that, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think as I, I, uh, what it looks like experimentally is that there is a new gauge boson. Yes. That new gauge boson has a mass. Okay, I see. Standard model particles have an, a, a tiny charge under this. So effectively, that's, uh, that's kind of more what I meant. Like effectively, this now reduces to the problem of, oh, I think about it as though the photon had a mass and that's what I'm looking for. So it's more an experimental way of thinking about it, but theoretically it doesn't actually, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. All right. Okay, there are, there are a couple of questions. So let, uh, yeah, let me, actually, let me, uh, let me read them out since I can see it now. Uh, yeah, so uh, Yupin wants to know, is there any problem theoretically or experimentally with dark matter that's exactly massless? Yes, there is, because if it's exactly massless, it would not be, uh, it would be a relativistic particle. 
it was a relativistic particle it cannot be bound to the galaxy the uh, you know uh, I, I, uh, the um, escape velocity of our galaxy is about 10 to the negative 3 uh, so if it's actually uh, uh, at velocity order 1 it will not be bound to the galaxy so, so we know the dark matter cannot be relativistic uh, rushi joshi wants to know uh, your belief uh, wait a minute uh, Okay, okay, he wants to ask a question politely. He's still a new learner from what I've read. Uh, my belief to seek dark matter has been diminishing, okay? Given you have experience with all these hypotheses and the actual experimental data to date, what is your take on the scalability of dark matter research in the next five years? Well, look, what I would say is that there's, a, there's something like 60 orders of magnitude in parameter space. And all we have done is uh, probed a very, very small part of the dark matter sector, very small. Right, and given that we've only probed a very small part of it, uh, and this is what we've been doing for thirty years, largely. So I think it is much more exciting now because in the last decade there have been this huge number of experiments that have actually come about, which are now able to probe many more parts of the dark matter parameter space. So all I can tell you is that there's a lot more. I would say, uh, I th I think like a better way of doing it now. So in the in the case of WIMP dark matter, there were like ten experiments all of them looking at exactly the same dark matter candidate. Now we have 10 experiments looking at a variety of different dark matter candidates. So I think it's a better direction that the community is going in now than what it was doing in the past. But will we find dark matter? I have no idea, right? For all I know, the dark matter only interacts with us gravitationally. Uh, so, that, so that's one of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 I mean, it's a fact of our physics, right? Is that the world need not be kind to us. We can only go out there and look at what the world is like. And uh, that is something that we have decided to do. Right. And of yeah, course, I mean, there's always it. some, yeah, I guess there's always some merit in pushing technology to, to its maximum limit. I mean, it took almost 40 years for gravitational waves to be detected and sustained funding. I think that- uh, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, this is a, this is one of those things where I would basically say, you know, um, uh, there is no way we're going to find what dark matter is by uh, any other. I mean, it's, it's it's about like what kind of particle there is in the world, right? You can't answer that question through any kind of mathematics or things like that. You just have to go and actually do the experiment. Right. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so I don't see any raised hand or any other questions in the chat box. So let's uh, thank uh, Surjit. Oh, Penta is here. Anyway, you have a comment? Okay. Thank, thank you, you for a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank so you. we will uh, see tomorrow. Surjit again tomorrow. So there are three lectures in a row at 7.30 p.m. at the same time. Uh, so thank you very much, Surjit. Uh, we will see you tomorrow. So we'll uh, meet again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. for uh, Simon's uh, second lecture. Okay. Right. See you all. Okay. Bye-bye.